All right, welcome everyone to our foreclosure prevention methods mm -hmm. during COVID-19 and how to navigate the Paycheck Protection Program webinar hosted by Enterprise and our rural and Native American team. But before we begin, I would like to go over a couple of logistics. Um, this webinar is being recorded and all audience members are muted upon entry. Please use the chat feature to submit any questions that you have during the presentation. Um, all participants will receive a copy of today's <clears throat> webinar recording and the PowerPoint slides. And most importantly, just please be patient with any technical difficulties. Um, now I will hand it over to Dustin Baird program officer for our native program and he will go over the mission of enterprise um, and introduce our speakers for today. Oh, um, uh, my relatives. I am Dustin Baird. I am the Native American Housing Program Officer here at uh, Enterprise Rural Native American Program. And um, just a brief history on, on um, our program. Um, of course, Enterprise was, um, was founded in 82 when they started getting getting into a affordable housing and the rural and Native American program was created in 1997 um, <clears throat> and it was based in uh, Albuquerque New Mexico and it, it was basically just um, to serve the Pueblos you know and just New Mexico and it was intended to do outreach technical assistance to help Pueblos with their housing needs a lot uh, a lot had to be done with right, right around home repairs but that was basically the start. So from the 90s to 2003, um, Enterprise was involved in about 50 developments in Indian country, small to large, about 100 million was invested and right around a thousand units were created, um, which uh, in, incentivized other investors to, to get into a, the tribal housing game because if uh, Enterprise and Fannie Mae could get in there and navigate, navigate uh, all the issues right around sovereignty and trust land, um, they figured that it was, it was a good fit for them as well. And then um, <clears throat> in 2000, we started our Rose Fellowship and the program started in, in that first class, we had a, a Rose Fellow from OK Owingo, Mr. Jamie Blazer. And that, that's been continuing up until now, uh, including um, the one that had just left Thunder Valley. And of course, our very own Alicia Ginsburg, who's helping out with uh, Kia with Paula, the Kia with Paula project out there in Rosebud. So um, really appreciate that. <clears throat> and myself, I am, uh, I'm enrolled, a enrolled member of the Rosewood Sioux tribe, but I'm also um, from the Iron Cloud Teoshua in Pine Ridge, South Dakota. So that's just a little bit of history on us and, and um, what we've been doing here at the R Rural Native American Program for Enterprise since uh, the inception in 1997. But um, today, today we've got two awesome, awesome um, speakers. Uh, they're women warriors. They uh, walk, walk with love for their community. So our first speaker will be Ms. Fern, Fern Ori out of the Wisconsin Native Loan Fund. And she's gonna be speaking on pre and post award details of the, the Triple P program, the Paycheck Protection Program, and how they were awarded it. Uh, one of the things is that um, we had a call with NTAI on Sunday, all about the, all about uh, tribal tribal entities applying for the Triple P program. And at the, I stayed on at the very end of the program. People, were, the call people were dropping off, and I I sat on just to listen to listen to the uh, presenter speak. And what was said was, okay, it's out there now. All they got to do is apply. So in that, with that being said, um, we want to be able to show that if we didn't, if, if, our, if our tribal entities did not get, the, get selected for the Paycheck Protection Program, it isn't because we didn't try. We want, to, we want the data to show that we actually tried. So Fern's going to talk a little bit about that. And then of course, we have Ms. Robin Danner out of, out of HCDC out of Hawaii. Um, helping out our relatives out there. She's gonna talk about the mortgage foreclosure program that they, ha that they have and the cultural approach that they're taking to it. Not the Western, Western approach, but the cultural approach for, for the native Hawaiians to keep native Hawaiians in their houses and not be foreclosed upon. 
and last but not least, how they're um, <clears throat> how they're protecting one of our as indigenous peoples, our most valuable resources, um, our wisdom keepers, our walking libraries, the elders, and uh, what we what we refer to as elder huts. Miss Dana will present on that uh, wonderful stuff they're doing out there. But first, I'm going to hand it on over to uh, the uh, <clears throat> the executive director of the RNAP program, my supervisor, Miss Susan Anderson, and she's going to talk a little bit about policy and what's being what's going on right on the Triple P program right now. So with that, um, I'd like to thank you all for joining our our webinar. And uh, without further ado, I'll let Susan take it from here. Thank you. Thank you, Dustin. Uh, you can advance to the next slide, Adrian. Um, and just want to welcome everybody for hopping on today. Appreciate your partnership and attendance. And I'm going to keep my comments pretty brief, but wanted to go through um, a quick update on sort of where things stand uh, in terms of what's coming out of Congress and Washington in terms of response to COVID-19 um, and and help way some understanding for um, some of the um, protections there are for existing mortgage owners and homeowners. Um, so just a quick update. Um, I think everybody is well aware that the Triple P program received more funding uh, last week and the money became available yesterday morning. So that now creates a total amount for the Paycheck Protection Program at $670 billion. Um, and through the, the um, PPP and Healthcare Enactment Act that passed last week, there's an additional $321 billion to help replenish what, um, what the first act provided. Um, a couple things to underscore with this replenishment is that there is a set aside for depository institutions such as CDFIs. 30 billion for those institutions with 10 to 50 billion in assets and 30 billion for institutions with uh, assets under 10 billion. Um, you know, we're hearing estimates that these funds are going to draw down at a rate of 60 billion per day. And so if that's the case, funds will probably be emptied again by Monday of next week. Other estimates I've heard is that these funds are going to go as quick as just two days, which means uh, get your applications in now if um, you're interested in applying for these funds, which um, Fern's going to go into a little bit more about applying for these funds um, and that process. Um, but just to underscore that these funds will go quickly, so act fast. Although I did hear that yesterday the SBA's uh, website crashed for any lenders that were trying to get applications in. So. Um, not sure what that really means for, for the drawdown rate, but act fast. The other thing to sort of underscore about the act that was passed last week, um, it, it provides additional funding for the EIDL part of the program, which is um, emergency loans and grants. Something to highlight through here is that for the first time, agricultural enterprises are eligible. And so for any of our native CDFI partners that are supporting ag businesses um, that could be of benefit to your clients. And then the rest of the pieces in the act were really about hospitals and healthcare um, for basically emergency relief to um, reimburse expenses or losses related to COVID-19. And then 25 billion to help expand COVID-19 testing capacity. I will point out that there was a special set aside specifically for rural health clinics, so that was a benefit. Next slide, please, Adrian. Um, so quickly, what's next? Uh, what's coming out next? Already Congress is underway of, of trying to put together the fourth broad stimulus package in response to COVID-19, um, trying to fill the gaps that weren't addressed in the first package, although uh, Congress is at recess, so we don't really expect to see much um, before May 4th when they come back after recess. But um, we've heard that the House is likely going to take the lead on the first draft, and they've asked their member offices um, to submit priorities for the bill by the end of the week, and we anticipate we'll see language for the bill shortly thereafter. 
Basically, what's on the table for negotiations include funding for state and local governments to make up for budget shortfalls, expansion of funding for unemployment benefits, and additional cash payments, food stamps, and new infrastructure spending potentially. And so, of course, um, enterprise and other housing advocacy organizations are working to ensure that housing provisions are included in this bill as well. Next slide, please, Adrian. Um, and so what that looks like from enterprises perspective is is advocating for additional allocation of home investment uh, specifically to help support rent shortfalls um, asking for 40 million in section 4 capacity building which you all are aware of that program and um, likely are a grant recipient of this funding source uh, the other thing that we're asking for is that um, usda's rural development um, and housing services programs get funding on par with um, what HUD um, properties received through the first act, uh, CARES Act, and then uh, funding to support FEMA. Next slide, please, Adrian. Um, so what I quickly wanted to highlight for folks today too, because it feels like there's a lot of um, uh, uncertainty and confusion swirling around about foreclosure mor moratoriums and forbearance. So quickly gonna highlight um, a piece of this and, and what uh, is being put out by different mortgage lenders depending on the type of um, loan you have and how they're responding to that. So basically through the CARES Act, um, there's two pr uh, protections put in place for homeowners with federally backed mortgages. So um, we'll talk about what happens if you don't have a federally backed mortgage in a little bit, but specifically if you have a federally backed mortgage, um, there is a moratorium on foreclosures, which basically means that um, a lender or loan servicer cannot foreclose on a borrower for 60 days after March 18th, 2020, which is roughly May 10th. Um, and specifically the CARES Act prohibits lenders and servicers from beginning a judicial or non-judicial foreclosure against a borrower or from finalizing a foreclosure judgment. Um, so that moratorium on foreclosures is just about up. Um, the other piece that is in the act is uh, forbearance. So basically, if anyone has experienced a hardship due to um, COVID-19, they have the right to request a forbearance of up to 180 days. And basically a forbearance will enable the borrower to either reduce their payments or put their payments on hold until they're able to regain um, their income or financial standing. However, that borrower has to contact their loan servicer to request the forbearance. I think additional thing to point out with this is that there's no fees, penalties, or additional interest that can be added to that mortgage. Um, and also to highlight, uh, a borrower does not need to submit any additional documentation to qualify that they have a pandemic related hardship for any federally backed mortgage. It's enough to say I'm experiencing a financial hardship related to the coronavirus. That's it. I do have some resources listed here on this slide and everybody will get a copy of the PowerPoint. Um, the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau has a guide um, for mortgage relief options, as well as a guide for what to do if you can't pay your mortgage. I highly recommend checking out these links uh, as a housing counselor or someone who may be supporting partners or clients that have a mortgage, uh, especially um, that first link just has some really great resources from how to explain forbearance to um, you know different types of support that folks can access and just even understanding rights as a homeowner in this time. And then I'll also point out Freddie Mac has a sustaining homeownership in a crisis, another great sort of resource and um, to utilize with clients or borrowers as they try to navigate um, how to access a forbearance and what that might mean for them. Uh, next slide, please, Adrian. So one of the things that I wanted to touch on is, as I said, there's a lot of uncertainty and confusion about um, what forbearance means when that 180 days or the 180 day extension is up. So 
basically, if you have a Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, HFA, or Housing Federal Housing Administration loan, which is through HUD, and so that includes the Section 184 and the 184A of Veterans Affairs or a um, USDA 502 director or um, guaranteed loan, you don't have to pay back the amount that was suspended all at once. No lump sum payment unless you are able to do so. However, depending on uh, the type of mortgage a borrower has, each sort of federal agency is having a different approach to what that actually looks like. So again, in this slide, um, once you get it, you'll have some links that you can click on to, to follow through and get more direct information about how each agency is um, approaching post forbearance. Um, but basically, Section 184, 184A, what um, the FHA is saying is that you could potentially be eligible for a COVID-19 standalone partial claim, which is they're basically structuring it as a no interest uh, second loan. And then those payments on the partial claim, uh, you don't have to pay until the payoff of the loan um, or the sell of the property or refines, what have you. So basically it's like you can just um, pay that a little bit over time or at the end of your mortgage maturity date. Next slide, please, Adrian. Um, the other thing that uh, I'll put out there, if you have a Freddie Mac or Fannie Mae um, guarant backed loan, um, again, there's been some um, clarification release that those mortgages are not required to repay the missed payments in one lump sum uh, when the forbearance period expires. Um, so mortgage servicers will attempt to contact borrowers 30 days before the forbearance plan is scheduled to expire um, to see if the temporary hardship has been resolved and discuss repayment options. Um, and there's actually um, in this link here on this slide, you can go and see the actual script that the GSEs are providing to mortgage servicers just to get a better sense of how to navigate a phone call with um, your lender should you be looking to request a forbearance and gain understanding about how to um, negotiate or understand what happens post forbearance. Uh, with USDA, um, again, no lump sum required. Basically, their uh, guidance putting out is that upon completion of the forbearance, the lender shall communicate with the borrower and determine if the borrower is able to resume making regular regular contractual payments. Uh, if so, then the borrower just makes those payments. But if not, then um, there's the option to extend the loan term um, or um, move through to going through their regulations around loss mitigation guide, which I'm linking to here. But basically what that looks like is, you know, a special forbearance or a loan modification. Um, but basically, there's all of sort of the options of maybe uh, making additional um, payments or increasing payments or paying it off at the end of the loan or potentially tacking it on to the loan and just moving those payments to the end. And that's also true of the um, Veterans Affairs Home Loan. Um, and basically the guidance that the VA is putting out is that um, you know, a, a loan modification can occur or uh, an alternative to that, um, the VA would allow those missed payments again to be tacked on or just due at the end of the loan or to increase payments. Um, so anyway, I thought that was useful to put out there just because there has been a lot of confusion around the need for homeowners that um, do need a forbearance to then have to do lump sum payments. But um, each uh, organization is sort of our um, mortgage lender or guaranteed is taking a bit of a different approach, but 
all sort of saying the same thing. And then if you don't have a, a federally um, backed mortgage, the best thing to do is still reach out to your lender. And again, I think refer um, to that Consumer Finance Protection Bureau and their guidance about potential options. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Fern to talk about um, accessing the PPP funds. Thanks everybody. Thanks for the awesome information, Susan. So goalie everyone, hello. My name is Fern Ori. I'm from Oneida, Wisconsin, and I run the statewide CDFI, the Wisconsin Native Loan Fund. Um, sorry, I don't have a photo available. Hopefully that doesn't have to be on screen the whole time. But um, We just wanted to talk a little bit about our experience accessing the Triple P program. Um, I did just want to give a couple other details about some of the basics like Susan brought up. Um, it's a, a loan that can be forgivable if it's used uh, according to how the SBA um, intended the program. Um, if the loans are used for payroll costs, interest on mortgages, rent and utilities, um, as long as it's 75% of the monies are used towards that, it can be a forgivable loan, AKA a grant, um, along with those payroll costs that includes also things like health benefits and things of that nature, which is pretty awesome. Um, as we all know, the first round of money was gone very quickly and the second round just opened as of 10.30 a.m. yesterday to apply. Um, those that are eligible are um, all small businesses, small businesses with 500 or fewer employees, which includes nonprofits, veterans organizations, tribal organizations, um, self-employed individuals, sole proprietorships, independent con contractors, all of those organizations are eligible to apply. Um, I'm not quite sure if there's any new caveats with the second round that came out, but that was the first initial triple P eligibility requirements. Um, and basically what's, what's really nice that I'm not sure if people were able to see, the actual application itself is very simple. Um, it was basically a two page document. Actually, I should have had that on the screen. I apologize, I didn't have that uploaded, but it's pretty simple. You talk about your business name, the you know basic information like your address, ITN number, I'm sorry, EIN, primary contact information, um, the gathering of information that you'd probably have to concentrate on the most is determining payroll costs and they ask for two and a half months worth of a calculation um, of basically payroll costs or any other of those eligible costs that you're going to roll into this loan. And then um, the number of employees, they wanna make sure you have under the 500. Um, and then of course the purpose, are you using it for majority is payroll? Are there any other utilities or lease or mortgage interest costs that you're gonna use? If there's any ownership in the company, you include all of that information. And then there's a series of uh, basic questions like, you know, have you ever been delinquent or defaulted on any federal agency loan or agreement? You know, just your average run of the mill questions to make sure that you wouldn't be disqualified for other reasons. So to me, it was refreshing to have a very simple, quick application. I think the key for a lot of people is to understand where you can go to actually apply. And basically that's through any FDIC insured financial institution that is participating in the program. Ideally, you should be a 7A SBA lender. What's awesome is there are native owned banks, there's local banks, of course there's big banks, but there's CDFIs even that are all um, actually PPP lenders through SBA that you're able to go to whether you're a CDFI, a small business, or um, any of our CDFI's clients, um, basically directing people to these financial institutions that are doing the SBA lending. Uh, we were able to access my tribe's bank. It's called Bay Bank. It's located right on the Oneida Reservation in Green Bay, Wisconsin. 
Um, we're a local community bank, and of course, we have a strategic plan to serve tribes, tribal communities, tribal members, first and foremost, but of course, the local folks around the area as well. Um, Bay Bank is also one of the premier HUD 184 lenders in our state and surrounding areas. So really, um, native-centric borrowing and services that Bay Bank is trying to provide and what I love is the fact that our bank got a leg up on this triple P um, and really started to work with SBA immediately so they could be online, ready to lend and go through their portals. Um, I've talked to the CEO of Bay Bank, his name is Jeff Bowman, about the process. And it was crazy, he said, because not only was there a very quick turnaround time in the funding availability for this, but on SBAs and with them working with probably hundreds of financial institutions to get them online and up and running with this account portal to do triple P loan authorizations quickly. It sounded like there were six days that in the process, SBA was trying to get their account working properly with Bay Bank. So not only were they trying to do all of these loans quickly and easily, they were also dealing with the um, of course, technology challenges on that end as well. But what's wonderful is um, Bay Bank did 68 triple P loans in 13 days. They loaned out $9.8 million in triple P um, loans. Um, these covered 1,700 jobs. Um, and of those 68 loans, 25 of them were tribally owned businesses. So I think that's pretty cool to showcase the fact that you have a native owned bank working directly in native communities and ensuring that as many native owned businesses and clients are able to access these funds. Round two, knowing how quickly things went through on round one, I'm sure that there's going to be even more um, valued efforts to make sure that as many native owned businesses and clients are not left behind. We also want to encourage any native CDFIs because we're all pretty much nonprofits that uh, your organizations are eligible as well. That's why I felt the need to jump on that as soon as I heard that our native CDFI would qualify for eligibility. And I thought, oh my goodness, this is basically a grant if we follow through properly with payroll expenses as our basis for application. And I thought this is, you know, <clears throat> extremely necessary for our organization. And uh, I just made sure that we found out the application process right away. I uh, called our bank, Bay Bank, to find out if they are processing. They said yes. And we worked with them very closely to make sure that I had the, all the elements that we needed for that simple application. And on their end, that they had the documents they needed from us as well. What's really nice is the fact that um, if you have established relationships with certain financial institutions that are doing these triple P loans, they have all of your information already, like organizational documents, any financials that are necessary, et cetera. But all we really had to submit was the application itself, which I mentioned is very simple, and then some payroll information for a couple of months worth from 2019. And basically the bank uh, does their end of submitting your loan application along with the cover loan sheet from their end as the lender and it goes up through the SBA to their processing portal. They approve it, actually they approved it in the same day, which is awesome. Um, I never hear of a turnaround time like that, especially with a federal agency processing, you know, thousands and thousands of applications. Um, I'm not sure, you know, if that was just because it was in the front end of the Triple P process or um, if things slowed down or, or ramped up in a certain way, but I'm assuming that it's going to go like lightning speed this round as well. And we really wanted to make sure that we got as much information out there to Native communities and organizations about the process so that it's not a daunting thing, so that it's not something that people should be um, discouraged. We want to encourage everybody get on the horn, um, find an organization in your neck of the woods that processes triple P's, and it's very simple <clears throat> to apply. 
Um, if you use it towards 75% or more as payroll, utilities, et cetera, it's a forgivable loan. And the process goes something like, you have eight weeks to spend the money. In those eight weeks, when that time is up, you basically um, work with your triple P lender, our case that's Bay Bank. And I think it's a simple form you fill out along with doc documentation showing this is how we spent that money. And then I think they upload it to SBA. And then when SBA approves, that's there's basically verifying you've spent the money accordingly, according to their eligibility and eligible expenses. They let the bank know, okay, this is a loan that's being considered forgivable. And I think they have 90 days after that determination to uh, reimburse, SBA will reimburse that bank for that loan, including any accrued interest. And then I think the borrower, meaning Winliff, we would get documentation saying this loan is paid in full, it's forgivable, something of that nature. So that's, you know, when you talk eight weeks, that's two months of payroll. I know any organization, especially nonprofit CFIs, always looking for operating capital. This is huge for us. In fact, we are trying to hire another position during this eight weeks. So it's like another necessity for us to access more funding for payroll purposes. Um, and I think, you know, the notion of, of course of Triple P is to help organizations weather the storm and of course to encourage organizations to not furlough people and not lay people off and encourage that employment is stable as much as possible. Um, I think another key thing to point out too is you have Native American banks like uh, Oneida Bay, you know, Bay Bank, you have Native American Bank itself. I think they're also processing triple P's. There's other CDFIs along um, the lines of, I know in Wisconsin, we have First American Capital Corporation. They do all small business lending. They were just approved to be an SBA 7 lend, 7A lender. So they're going to be processing triple P applications. Every state is going to have CDFIs along with, of course, financial institutions that are processing triple P applications. I believe that sba.gov on their website, they may have a list, uh, hopefully it's broken out by state of where you can go to apply for these triple P loans. Um, and I just wanted to make sure that we highlight that it was easy. Uh, it's relatively low information that you need to provide as far as documentation, mostly payroll info. And we just really want to encourage everybody to try to take advantage of this opportunity because obviously things like this don't come very often and it's widely needed by all. I'm not sure if there's any other things that I can point out or questions on that, but that's basically been our experience. And we wanted to just give a big, huge yoanko to Bay Bank and all of these organizations that are providing triple P processing. And then of course to an enterprise for holding this important webinar. Thank you, Fern. Um, we do have one question that came through in the in the chat, um, not related to PPP, but related to the foreclosure and forbearance information that Susan presented from Greta. Um, and it was about whether or not all loan modifications require BIA mortgage documents to be updated or require a council resolution approving for the loan modification. Um, Susan, you answered that. Do you wanna chime in there? Sure, yeah, thank you, Robin. Um, and just to say, that's a great question. And I think it's, that can't be really answered um, in a general way. It really depends sort of on what was in place when that mortgage closed in terms of, um, you know, what was the existing um, mortgage ordinance with the tribe or what was the agreement with the lender um, as to what would, what would happen if there was a need for a um, loan modification. Um, so I would just say, given that it's unlikely that anyone that has a um, need for a forbearance would then be able to do a lump sum payment, I would just encourage folks that are working with borrowers and their clients to start looking at that process as early as possible. That way everything's in place when the forbearance period ends and, and you can work out with the lender what 
um, needs to happen post forbearance and just have everything in place um, at that time. So I realize that's probably a non-answer, Greta, but I think it's just gonna depend um, community to community and, and what was in place when that mortgage closed. Yeah, I would second that, Susan. It also depends on if there's a lien against the property um, on behalf of the tribe or the council as well. If that's the case, then that will be required before a formal loan modification is um, able to be put in effect, but it's not necessarily required um, for the forbearance period. So counsel for forbearance first and then try to work on what's needed for that loan modification. Okay, fantastic. Now we're going to move on to Robin Danner. And um, Dustin did a much better introduction than I can. So um, Robin, who comes to us from Homestead Community Development Corporation is going to take over at this point. Thank you. Will I turn my video on? Yep, we can see you. Thanks, Great. Robin. Okay, I just want to, I know that I speak on behalf of Fern too. This is a uh, torture, but we're doing it. We're trying to be better at being um, <laughs> sharing and being scared at the same time. So thank you, Enterprise, for the opportunity for this torture. <laughs> Hi, Fern. All right, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Robin Danner. We are a Native Hawaiian CDFI. We're serving trust lands in the state of Hawaii on six islands in the 50th state. Go ahead, Robin. Uh, Susan and Dustin asked that we share our work on foreclosure prevention, so I just wanted to give a, some quick baseline information for my colleagues. Hawaiian Homes Commission Act, similar to the Indian Allotment Acts of that same era, was enacted by Congress and established a land base and land allotments for na the Native Hawaiian people. We have 203,000 acres. To put that in perspective, there are only 4 million total acres in the entire uh, state of Hawaii state of Hawaii. Uh, we are eligible for allotments similar to Indian allotments re for residential, for farm, for ranch, for mercantile. Uh, what folks may not know is Congress split the baby back in 1920. The missionary children who became the merchants here in 1920 wanted 100% blood quantum for a native Hawaiian to actually get a, a parcel. Our prince, our prince Kuhio, uh, Jonah Kuhio Kalani on Ole wanted 132nd. So the Congress cut it in half and split the baby, and that's why our allotment act today has a blood quantum of half. So you have to be half Hawaiian and you can be a quarter to an inherit in, inherit. Um, obviously, that's tough on our people because it creates the uh, half or more and the half uh, or, or less than half. Uh, this land trust has oversight by the Department of Interior. It doesn't necessarily mean they've done an awesome job, uh, but uh, we need to help, as Indian Country does with your BIA, uh, our office at DOI needs our engagement. What may be stunning to most of my colleagues is that our land trust is not administered by our tribes, our, uh, but it's administered by the state of Hawaii. So if you think about the state of Wisconsin, for example, administering tribal lands in the state of Wisconsin or in South Dakota or North Dakota, uh, how frightening that is. It is a major uh, challenge, uh, but it is the reality that Native Hawaiians live in. There, over the last 100 years, there's only been 10,000 Alatis that have made it through. There are 28,000 50% Hawaiian or more that remain on a wait list. So I'm just giving you context. It's why preventing foreclosure becomes so powerfully important. We can't afford to lose a single uh, allotment. Next. What we learned about foreclosure prevention is that most foreclosure prevention programs <clears throat> start with the premise that a delinquent loan uh, that our people, our borrowers, automatically, they need budget counseling. They don't know what they're doing. It assumes that a home delinquency is caused by poor money management or it's caused by an unwillingness to pay. And we have found in our research last year with the help of Enterprise and this cohort, frankly, I really wanna thank Susan uh, for taking a leap of faith that, that we should explore this. We have found this to be not the case at all. It is the smallest percentage. Uh, what we learned is that most home delinquencies 
are actually caused by a bad event, not bad habits of that, that normally would require budget counseling. Um, most delinquent borrowers, interestingly, we're finding, have low to no revolving credit. That is an excellent criteria for good money managers. Low income poverty doesn't mean a lack of skills in managing money. And in fact, I would say it increases skills because there's less room to make a mistake. So the right pre premise that we learned uh, is that our people, our borrowers, they don't need to be referred to budget counseling. Uh, they need a financial analyst uh, to address a loan delinquency next. So again, I'm just gonna reiterate counseling. What we often think about is counseling versus mitigation analysis. If uh, our families have a bad habit, they're buying Gucci, they're going to Vegas instead of making the bill payment, okay, sure, counseling, budgeting, et cetera. But we have not found that our people uh, are typical for being uh, making bad choices financially or poor budgeting or poor spending habits. What we have found in uh, loan delinquencies is that a one-time bad event has occurred causing the delinquency. Um, and when a bad event happens, for example, job loss, uh, a divorce, death, or a health issue that has interrupted an, a, a original uh, good loan made based on good criteria, uh, that is the bad event. No amount of counseling, no amount of budget uh, counseling is going to fix that delinquency, it, uh, that bad event. So bad habit versus bad event. So what we learned is the vast majority of our delinquent families are tied back to a bad event. Go ahead. Next. All right, so foreclosure prevention on our homesteads, I can't speak for others. I can only speak for us as Native Hawaiians. Uh, the, the steps really have been that a very, very good loan was made against a home on our trust lands. We call them homesteads. You call them reservations or allotments. Uh, number two, the loan becomes delinquent either because of a bad habit or a bad event. If it's a bad habit, refer to financial counseling. Uh, the home can be saved with a change of habits. But again, I cannot emphasize as uh, enough, we are finding in the 75 to 80 percentile of loan delinquencies actually need no financial counseling. They are bad events that need mitigation assistance uh, and can be saved with a change of loan terms. I so appreciate Susan laying out the forbearance and loan mods uh, because it totally relates uh, to our, our work here on our trust lands. So number three, what this has led us to be to, do, to decide is that our uh, nonprofit has decided to become financial analysts, not, not necessarily the typical uh, housing counsel, counseling agency, uh, but actual financial analysts and to provide mitigation services. Really, uh, when a bad event happens, uh, success happens when the loan becomes performing again based on what? What is a forbearance? What is a loan modification, a loan assumption? It's basically new lending, new loan underwriting uh, that, that was done at the original aspect of the loan and now needs to be re-underwritten based on uh, the post-event problem. Failure for us is foreclosure, eviction. The home is sold, the family, the kids, multi-generational displacement. So it was really a wake up call for us and I can only speak for our uh, work in homesteads that we need to turn, uh, turn the ship toward financial analyst, anal analysis and mitigation. Next. What mitigations are typical? Susan rang off a, a bunch of them and I think too often, at least for us at our nonprofit, we were relying on and dependent on other nonprofit organizations that maybe didn't really have a good cultural understanding of our people and they were just de deploying regular housing counseling, getting referrals automatically. Um, but what we found is that the typical mitigations that were, are, are available to off trust lands and not often for our families are these. Informal forbearance, which uh, Susan called a lump sum, we call it catch up. A military forbearance, uh, which is federal uh, law. Third, an external cure, meaning 
uh, you can identify a, a, a different funding source to pay off that delinquent loan and save the home. Uh, D, a loan modification, a change of loan terms to match the new reality. And what I, I, the reason why these are different colors is that what we found is Native Hawaiians are basically offered these two in blue. We're offered a chance to catch up or get out or go find someone to pay off the, the lender or get out. Uh, very few, uh, we aren't even asked if we serve in the military and very few loan modifications are pursued by the lenders on Hawaiian homelands. Go ahead. The next is a loan assumption. Powerful tool culturally if we understand uh, what it is and how to use it. And so our team is learning more about that. Uh, essentially, the delinquency is cured through a loan assumption. You might replace the borrower or you might add a nephew or an adult child. Uh, and there's a loan assumption that's done post event. And then also a short sale or deed in lieu, which really is to suspend any foreclosure action by the, by the lender and the borrower and lender agree to transfer the home, which could be to a child, a, a relative, uh, and we live in multi-generational homes uh, in order to pay off the debt. And then finally, we are absolutely not getting access to this, at least to our native people on our trust lands, which are direct mitigation assistance often available in many, many states, which is interest rate and principal buy downs, partial loan forgiveness, uh, silent seconds, which uh, Susan mentioned a little bit about moving the delinquent lump sum to the end of the loan, um, et cetera. These are in green. We have found where our people, our families are absolutely uh, disconnected from these very powerful ways to uh, cure delinquency and stave off um, evictions. Next. So I just wanted to visually show that what's happening to our people uh, is we are framed, every delinquency is framed as a bad habit. It's got to be the Hawaiian. It's got, they're, they're, they're a bad habit. They need a counseling fix. So almost automatically, every single time we get referred to a counseling agency that attempts to sit down and uh, show us how to do budgeting. Not understanding that the delinquency is a bad event. Um, and so the options that our trust land communities are primarily getting uh, access to when a delinquency occurs is forbearance. Catch up, we'll give you six months, we'll give you a year to catch up, but then you've got to uh, come, come clean or we're going to foreclose and evict. Or they give us the option of finding some other lender or somebody else, uh, an external source to pay off the loan or else foreclose and evict. Those are the primary uh, so, uh, options that are obvious and made available to Native Hawaiian families. Next. If you're off homesteads or off trust lands, uh, the most common um, options available to a family that's in delinquency, they get the catch up with, with payments and forbearance. They get the external cure of delinquency, just like us. Next. But they also get specific processes for loan modification uh, or a loan assumption or to do a short sale or a transfer of the home to someone else, a stranger or to a family. And they also have access to direct assistance. These last two, we simply uh, need to do better. Uh, and we have decided as a nonprofit CDFI that this is what we're going to focus on rather than uh, uh, teaching our families how to budget. Our families know how to budget. What we don't have is access to curing delinquencies based on an event. Next. And so off homesteads, all of these opportunities are pr provided um, before a foreclosure or an eviction. And the lenders are far more attentive to off homesteads because they are involved and they have something to lose uh, as the lender uh, off, our, off our trust lands. And so they spend a good amount of time attempting to uh, get this delinquency cured. Whereas on our trust lands, they do not, and I'll explain why. Next. I wanted to give a quick profile. We had a single mom, 54 years old, three sons, one grandchild in the home. The woman has had consecutive employment with the state government of 19 years. 19 years consecutive employment. Um, and this is a really basic profile of most of our families. We are not skippers, jumping around, et cetera. 
She's at 80% AMI. She's going to college online to get her bachelor's degree. She fell delinquent to a lender by 900 bucks, started getting um, uh, threats of foreclosure. Uh, her total loan balance was 45,000, stressed out to the max. What was the cause? A loss of partial income. It was an event. And so she doesn't need uh, budget fine counseling. She needed a mitigation. She needed a loan modification, simple. Add the adult sons, which increases income, uh, and we, re we modify the loan. She needed an advocate to point that out to the lender. Go. So I just wanted to uh, cover foreclosure and the eviction process for Hawaiians, for us on trust lines. I can't speak for others, but the lender makes a good loan. A bad event happens five years, 10 years down the line. They need mitigation, not budget counseling. It was a bad event. There was a death. Poor mitigation and no foreclosure process is uh, what happens to our people because the lender, once a mortgage lender gets in delinquency, they just assign the loan to state government. Remember what I said. And so they have no incentive to do what they do for off trust land uh, families. Next. So then once our loan is assigned to state government, which is our local version of the BIA, uh, they treat Hawaiians as, check this, landlord tenant, not homeowners, which is less rights, less opportunities, and so much easier for the attorney general of our state to evict and uh, seize the home asset. The state has no written loan servicing policies or mitigation, so everything is practically verbal. This is the reality we're living in now, but we're, we need to change this. Next. State government can then cancel our, our allotment lease, our 99 year leases, under an administrative, state administrative process. Next. Our families have 30 days to challenge that administrative process, which is the state government canceling our lease, not having to explain anything about typical foreclosure processes. And we have 30 days to challenge that in circuit court against the attorney general. That's who we would be standing in court with. And if you miss that 30 days, boom, the attorney general files for an ejectment as if we're a tenant rather than we have a lease for the land and we own a home on that uh, land. Next. The home asset is left vacant for years uh, by the state until the state sells it or transfers it, which destroys the equity owned by the native family. So Hawaiian families get displaced, equity is stripped out of their home and the allotment is lost. Go ahead. So our new approach to foreclosure prevention or homeownership retention is no more counseling that starts on the faulty premise for our families that delinquency is caused by a bad habit that needs budgeting. No, we are not going to start with that premise anymore that has been, that, that really is the national trend. The vast major majority are caused by a bad event and needs financial analysis. So number two, for us, no more reliance on lenders uh, to offer mitigation. We've decided that that's chasing an ambulance we'll never catch. So we've decided, and we're hoping with Enterprise and this cohort, you know, and all of our colleagues on this cohort will help us to get really good at this, that we have to know as a, as a native nonprofit what mitigations are. We have to get really good at it. We need to conduct financial assessments, not counseling to budget better which financial assessment is really being underwriters. We need to identify the bad event and we need to write up the mitigation request to the lender with the family to, to advocate for them. Next. Number three, we want to, and we're so prayerful that the enterprise family and this cohort family is gonna help us achieve something at the end of the year, which is to publish the first and only family guide to trust land foreclosure prevention. Um, to invest in the knowledge about trust lands, not just for lenders, but our own families, what are our rights, and to con conduct broad seminars across our trust lands to teach our people um, how to prevent foreclosure. And number four, 
uh, we are working to establish a legal defense fund to ensure court representation. Um, we want to invest in the knowledge of a pool of attorneys about trust lands in order to have our families no more standing alone in court. If you can even imagine the stress of that, our families are standing in court alone against the state of Hawaii's attorney general. Next. And number five, obviously we want to continue our advocacy at the state and federal level of legislation and uh, executive level, executive uh, branch uh, advocacy to implement policies to protect our trust land homeowners. We want to require HUD, ONAP, in the HUD 184A program to monitor, monitor lender mitigation rather than just signing off and allowing them to transfer the loan to state government. And it's like transferring us to the wolves uh, to require state government to treat us as homeowners and not tenants and to require written policies. And we believe these five things, uh, by the end of the year, we will be ch chugging along for the next 10 years result of Hawaiians passing on their allotments uh, to the next generation. Next. And so this is the next topic. Um, uh, Susan and uh, Dustin, did you want me to just run through this? This is a few slides and then do questions. Yeah, I think Robin, if you wanna just keep going um, okay. and then uh, folks can chat their questions and um, happy to, to have it run a little bit long so we get to everybody's questions, thanks. And then uh, Susan and Dustin asked that we uh, share our elder hut. This was a COVID-19 response product that we created in 11 days to launch once uh, the shutdowns happened. It's called the Homestead Unit Self-Quarantine or HUSC. We're offering 24 to 48 month loan terms of 2,500 to 7,500. The payments are as low as $90 to $183. Uh, first payments don't start for two months. Um, and these loans are to purchase materials to build a 10 by 12, what we called comfort sheds. Uh, I love that Dustin likes to call them elder huts. Um, and essentially it enables our uh, allotments, our allottees, our native families to add backyard detached bedrooms to our homestead properties that have an older home or even a new home because our elders and we native Hawaiians like probably many other of our native cousins are high risk family members, diabetes, et cetera, for this COVID-19. And so we want to protect our multi-generational uh, living that, that we do with intention, um, but now it's become dangerous because of the needs for social uh, distancing. Next. Next. Okay, I just wanted to show that it wasn't good enough for us to just create a loan product. We also created a material list. That's what that is on the left side. So this material list shows every dog on two, two by four plywood, et cetera, to build a 10 by 12 backyard bedroom. Uh, here's a picture of it being delivered. So we don't even have to leave our, our allotment. Uh, it gets delivered. That's what it looks like when it arrives next. They're there building the uh, floor. They put up the first wall. They've got four walls up. This was done in three days. Next. And that's the finished product on uh, day three uh, without painting and, and all of that. But the unit is up. And if you think about a 10 by 12, that's larger than a standard bedroom in, in a HUD house uh, that a, a lot of housing authorities uh, build. Next. And that's it. So I hope I did it within the time so that uh, Dustin doesn't, and Robin uh, Wolf and Susan are okay. Um, that was our my presentation. Um, that was great. We don't have any more questions that came up in the chat, but I did have one question for you, Robin. Um, I really appreciate your conversation about the mitigation assistance. And I was wondering if you guys have already started receiving calls um, for mitigation assistance um, in light of job loss and um, COVID related challenges. Yes, even during this uh, time that I've been with Enterprise on this call, I, I got a text message from a family. Um, so we have um, a portfolio now of foreclosure prevention um, 
Native Hawaiian families, and we're getting good results playing the role of underwriter and viewing it through the lens of mitigation uh, rather than catch up or else. Um, so thank you for that question. Yes, we are. Even though our state has done, uh, like many others, and Susan mentioned the moratoriums, um, that's not going to, uh, that doesn't relieve the stress. Our families know. And so um, even though there's these moratoriums that are going to expire, um, our phones are uh, lighting up so that we can help prepare our families to, to move from forbearance to what Susan talked about, which is um, loan modifications, moving the delinquents amount to the end of the loan. These are not concepts that most families uh, are aware of, nor why would, they, why would they be aware of it? And so we know it's our kuleana, our, um, our responsibility to um, play that role of intermediary and mitigator uh, to bring the, the awesome uh, mitigations that Susan laid out that came out of the CARES Act to make sure that our Native Hawaiian families uh, are touching those um, alternatives. Totally agree with you on that, Robin. Dustin, do you want to wrap up since we're at time? Um, sure, sure. Um, once again, on behalf of the RNAP program, Enterprises RNAP program, Rural Native American program, we want to thank our speakers. Ms. Robin Danner, you knocked it out of the park. Thank you once again for protecting one of our most valuable resources, our elders. And, and of course, you too, for Ms. Fern, Fern Ori, you know, <clears throat> they, they showed us that um, it, can, it can actually be done getting these, these triple P uh, funds and they showed us a way. So like I said earlier, um, let's, let's get it, let's get, let's get some of us to actually apply for this, you know? So whenever the federal government does look in, and say, well, once again, Native America is being underserved, it isn't because we didn't try, it's because once again, we were left out. And it'll give us something to argue about down the road. But like I said, once again, thank you all for showing up. and. Uh, that was a that was a great webinar. Thanks again to our two speakers. Thank you to thank you to Adrian and Robin for uh, helping out. Adrian doing doing her part and Miss Robin doing hers as well. Thank you and goodbye. All right, and the recording will be sent out uh, in the next two days along with the PowerPoints. So thank you guys again for joining. Doksha, okay. See you. Oh, thanks everybody. Have a good day. Thank you.